Um, our next session is Nearshore GPS, and we're going to unpack a little bit about around what markets um, you should be watching, where you can get the best value for your investments. So I ask Stephen Lloyd, who's our moderator for this session from Fust & Sullivan. Uh, Rodrigo, what are the hottest Nearshore markets, in your opinion, and why? The hottest location, it depends, obviously, first on the, on the, the real estate perspective, a company that it's looking to establish new operations, uh, that the process on selecting a country to establish new operation uh, has, I think, three major topics that are very important to consider before going to a new country. So the first is the availability of finding a qualified working force. The second will be the low risk it's a secure country, government issues. And the third uh, consideration that it's uh, where, where I'm getting, it's uh, the availability of buildings and premises that reach the requirements of these kind of companies and services. Based on that, I will say that, uh, well, obviously there are safe bets such as uh, Costa Rica and Mexico that are, are proven successful markets. Now we are finding that uh, markets such as Peru and Colombia are getting a lot of attention and are growing very fast. I will put my eyes on El Salvador, Guatemala, and maybe Honduras that are uh, uh, countries that uh, are um, investing a lot of resources on becoming competitive uh, destinations to attract uh, services companies. Can you identify a location or two that you think is innovating as far as some of the things that uh, Rodrigo mentioned, as far as uh, perhaps government involvement, for example? Yeah, one of our experiences in Jamaica that senior management uh, is uh, incredibly talented, incredibly committed. Uh, the workforce we've been very pleased with, uh, but there seems to be a gap in the middle. So mm -hmm. we, we finding supervisor middle management types of roles um, to, be, to be lacking, and we were having that discussion. Uh, government is stepping in, uh, realizing not just in the, the BPO space, uh, but that's a, a spot that through community colleges and, and the universities in Jamaica, they've, they've got to fill that gap, uh, mm -hmm. and they're actively uh, taking steps uh, to do so. Uh, which uh, should benefit uh, the entire operation uh, over time. Mexico, right? Um, my, my expertise is less on the BPO side and more on the IT services <coughs> side. So when you talk about IT services, uh, Mexico is making a pretty strong push to, to promote STEM, right? Uh, mm -hmm. According to, uh, to Mexican uh, figures, there's about you know, anywhere between 65,000 to 100,000 graduates per year in, in STEM fields. So, you know, the in innovating there is, uh, you know, is, is very important. And, and if I may just add to um, the, the criteria for choosing a country, I'll, I'll also add that uh, we, we found that not in BPO, because in BPO, uh, most of the time the services are going to be located in the country. But for IT services, the, the, the other criteria is how are uh, immigration treaties with the U.S., right? The ability to, uh, to take people who are working in one country into the other. And, you know, there, Mexico with the TN visa because of NAFTA being very similar to H-1B, you know, is, is, is also picking up a lot of steam as far as IT services go. I think the only thing I'll add, right, so we, we, we about a year ago launched in Honduras, feel very good about that country and kind of the support they're getting from the government and, and kind of the, the infrastructure that's there. Uh, and just made a decision about a month ago that we're going to put some, some uh, call center agents in Guatemala as well. So we're kind of following the path that you just mentioned. Um, where I've seen real success, though, I think is when the government doesn't just try to do it alone. When they find the right organization, consulting group, um, or, uh, or support to be able to develop a plan and a roadmap. I know that Honduras has gotten some help, but I think a little bit of it's organic and some of it's being driven by the industry. Mm. But I think if the government's really behind it and they go and they kind of build the right roadmap and get the right resources is when they're able to be really successful. What are buyers really demanding today um, as far as uh, uh, Nearshore goes and, and how is the Nearshore promise perhaps being fulfilled or not? Uh, in those demands. One of the, the fundamental things that we were looking uh, for when we started thinking about uh, Nearshore 
uh, really was proximity. Uh, mm. the, the, you know, the very first thing that, that we were looking at, we'd been in India for a couple of years, we've uh, got some other work in the Philippines and then a, a different piece of our business. Uh, so we really started taking a, a hard look at um, many of the Latin American countries that, that everyone's talking about today. And, uh, and for the most part, I, I would say there were all the vendors we met with were fabulous. So we were quite impressed uh, with the quality. Look, let's face it, it's a cost play as well. Uh, we look at these various countries and, and we, we, we go there because in, uh, in the case of, uh, of us, uh, having a downtown Toronto location, uh, legacy business, you know, at the end of the day, you've still got a, a quality level uh, that you need to meet. Uh, and, you know, we've been generally pleased that, that we've met that. Although we have brought back about 15% of the work back to Canada. Mm -hmm. we, we did find at the, at the end of the day, there's uh, high quality customers, high value customers that need a little bit more uh, care and attention, uh, complicated uh, issues uh, that, uh, that need to, uh, uh, need, needed to be, uh, to be brought back. So we've segmented our business uh, with now what we feel uh, is best in, in India. They do some things very well. What do we think is best handled uh, in Jamaica? And then we've, we funnel uh, some of the more difficult uh, issues uh, back to Canada. So that's kind of how we've tackled it. Great. And Philly, maybe you could yeah. chime in. Well, that, that, that's one of the uh, main characteristics that we're seeing in the marketplace, with technology becoming ubiquitous, available everywhere, and especially with the large buyers of uh, BPO and IT services uh, integrating their core technologies and making them available. Now what they're, what they're looking is for the ability of a vendor to distribute the processes. Mm. A task may start in the US, the next step may go into Mexico or Colombia, the third step may go to India and Philippines, go back to Mexico and then back in Canada or, or in the US. So that ability to integrate processes and to be able to um, take advantage, not, not, not of the whole process, but maybe of a particular task on, uh, with the characteristics of each one of the regions, it's becoming um, an, increase, uh, an increasing demand, from, especially from the large clients. I, it's tough, even, even within a country. You know, we're, we're probably a little overweight from a, a total agent count in the Philippines, but site to site things vary. So you know, trying to be consistent around the globe is everybody's goal. And I think you, the, the call center BPO perspective, I think a good provider can be maybe 75% standard on a global basis. Hmm. Not completely acceptable, um, but it's a, it's a big monster to all kind of make, make walk in the same direction at the same time. Um, and then some of the cultural differences that occur in different geos drive some of the, the difficulty in doing that as well. But I, I don't know that I've seen anybody do it, you know, close to 100%. Um, it, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't stop trying to get there, but, but they're not quite there. All the providers are showing us their best side uh, when they take us around to their operations globally, uh, but it's a challenging pursuit to get to uh, the, the holy grail that, that you're uh, referencing. We, as um, business partners, uh, own a big chunk of that as well mm -hmm. in that uh, as you learn a country and culture, and, and you're right, there, there, there's definite uh, uh, cultural differences in, in the various spots that we're all doing business. Uh, but over time, you begin to learn what they are good at. We've actually found that you know, certain things are done much better in India than they're done in Jamaica. Right. We're, we don't fight that. I mean, the, the reality is that that is just kind of, I, I think it is a cultural thing. And then the opposite's true. We've got some things that, that fit very well uh, in, uh, in that site. And, uh, and it took us a couple of years to get that. I think initially we thought we've got these three sites and we can just kind of move everything equally. And then we're probably four or five years uh, into Jamaica now, longer uh, in India. Uh, we actually now feel pretty good about the way we slice things up. If you've worked and, and, and have established a really solid relationship with your vendor or your partner network, having them contribute to those discussions, right? So we, we read the metrics, we see the performance, we know what, what's happening. Um, but I, I try to make sure and challenge them. What line of business is going to be best in this geography or this location? What, you know, you, you know best, or our partners know best, what the, the hiring profile is going to be, how many people can they fill, et cetera. So or is, it, is it going to be all tech? Is it going to be service, et cetera? What markets, we've heard a lot of good things so far, not just in our session, but previous ones. What markets are struggling uh, in the near shore region and maybe beyond in South America, and why? The whole world, and in particular in Latin America, 
uh, in the last 10 years, we have built a lot of capacity. Almost every country, there's a very few exceptions, there's, there's a lot of idle capacity. And, and I'm talking empty seats, cubicles, uh, infrastructure, and all that. So, so I think the challenge is not finding uh, capabilities, except for a, a couple of few countries. It is more about this partnership. It is about finding uh, the expertise within the partner that understands the particular processes that can integrate with the client and that can assign the right tasks and the right processes in the right geographies. You know, Panama is a market that um, we're on our second go around. Um, we had exited Panama uh, right around the time of the Sirius XM merger um, about nine years ago. Um, got back into it at the recommendation of one of our longer term partners, um, took a look at the market, and, and I, think what we, I think what we made a mistake at is we kind of swung at the wrong price. They offered us something really attractive to try to fill some of that capacity, um, and they weren't able to sustain the quality that we needed, but it is a market that we've seen no longer meeting our needs and had to, to exit from that market. If you want something more complex, right, that, you know, so the high value customers or IT services, you, you need to go to you know, countries that have more that capacity and capability, right? So rather than poo-pooing those countries that are smaller, right? I mean, historically, it's just, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of the attention has to be turned to those countries like Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, right? That, that, that have a high availability of, of human resources in order to fulfill that, that higher capacity. So, yeah, not, not sure about, you know, overall availability of talent. Just to add one more thing, I mean, it ultimately depends what you're looking for, right? Mm -hmm. If you're looking for a very specialized, small group of people who you're in touch with, who you're willing to give a lot of feedback, I think any country in the region, you know, can do, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah it, you, it, could, you could do anything with 50 people, Exactly. Right? If, it, yeah. if, it, it, if all you need is 50, they can be fantastic. But scale, yeah. complexity, you know, back and forth, uh, you know, exchanging people from one country to the other, that, that's where it starts getting yeah. more and more difficult. Maybe Michael could start us off on this issue of security as far as uh, compliance goes and these types of issues. The, the understanding of why things are important, PCI, right? So PCI compliance, if you're kind of really on the edge, if you're kind of type three or whatever the level three certification is today, there are different parts of the world that don't quite understand the need to have to do that or changes, right? What do you mean I can't have my cell phone in my pocket? What if my kid calls me in sick, et cetera? So, you know, I think that, that as we're looking at, at new places, um, we, we have to take into account any of the potential security risks from a data security standpoint that may exist in those regions. Somebody who's going to do the Target or, you know, Home Depot, those types of things are what I hope that IT people are worried about more than, than an agent in a call center. But it is all part of the chain and something that we have to be concerned about. Up until about a year ago, I, I walk into a call center and see paper all over the place. Mm. And it's from companies that are processing transactions and you know, it, it has become a very different environment today than, than I think it was even a year and a half ago. And, and regions play into that. Yeah, and without naming names, uh, any suspicions on any providers that are doing uh, data protection particularly well as partners to work with? We've started at the contractual level. So, you know, we've said here are our table stakes for security and compliance, and people have to be able to sign up for that. It's caused a little bit of pain on some of the smaller partners. Going to get an SSAE 16 certification and then PCI, like I said, DSS type 3, whatever the stuff is, um, is not cheap. Um, and particularly in some of our outbound telesales or some of the smaller BPO vendors that we deal with, it's a, it's a burden for them, but it is now kind of a requirement just to be able to come in and evaluate you as a company. What about the uh, aspect, that, again, I'm a little surprised sometimes when enterprises call us as analysts and they start asking about, um, I guess you'd call it geopolitical risk. They're sending some guys to a certain country. Do we think that it's safe? Um, do you, is that a concern in the region? Um, more than other regions, or is there a misunderstanding in the U.S.? Is it being exaggerated in the media, um, how safe or unsafe it might be, yeah, as far as nearshore and LATAM go? Why did we pick Jamaica? And proximity came up as, as a, a key issue. Very top near the list um, was the security issue. Uh, we believe very much in being involved uh, with our partners, so we've um, I'll probably have staff, uh, Toronto Star staff, in Jamaica for 12 weeks this year. Some of these uh, these folks, um, single moms, that kind of stuff, 
uh, it, where they're going matters, and and uh, it wasn't you know maybe the determining factor, but it was it was one of those things that you know and you, you look at them in in relative terms, looking at maybe six different countries, uh, and you know you, you've got to have your wits about you no matter where you are and what you're doing. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it, it played a significant uh, factor for us. So I don't think it's paranoia. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the considerations that you put in place. Mm -hmm. well, and, and there are corporations that have lists of companies where they cannot put operations down there. Uh, some of the largest, uh, without naming names, but uh, uh, they, they flat, flat out loud uh, their security protocols forbid them to putting operations on places where uh, some of us may think it's uh, perfectly reasonable and, and safe. As a, an analyst and as, and as an American, as most of you know, the, the, the security question is one that um, I tend to get a lot, which you know surprises me in 2015 from some big, pretty big and sophisticated enterprises across industries. I think, you know, you know, so two things. One, you can't you can't do this at a surface level. Right? If you Google crime in Honduras, you would never go to Honduras. <laughs> exactly. right? It just, try it. Um, but, um, well, but if you do crime in D.C., then... Yes. Well, so it, yeah. I, I, I believe me. I, I was there yesterday. It's exactly the same thing. Um, but um, but I, I, do think, I do think that when you have a good partnership or, or you're, you're working on developing a good relationship, that the BPO side of the house should hit that head on as well. It's going to be a question. Somebody has to answer the question whether whether I have to do the homework on my mm -hmm. own and then respond to my compliance officer or my finance VP or or something. So they, the question has to be answered, and and I mm -hmm. think that the the folks who are are managing that well are really addressing it head on, right? Yeah. And and making sure that you don't have to dig through and and seem like somebody's hiding that fact. If you could give us a little bit of color on how can uh, foreign companies, foreign companies who don't know how to deal with local laws or standard business uh, practices, start operating in a foreign location quickly and effectively. In this case, uh, in nearshore, can you give us some some background? Sure. So I, I I think this this question sort of has two two different levels, right? I mean, if if you're going to be using one of these service providers, obviously that that's that's a really easy answer. Um, we, we deal with a lot of customers who are the actual service providers. So we don't deal with the final customers, right? We deal with companies who are actually going into a different country, Mexico or Colombia or Peru or whatever, in order to set up operations from which they can serve customers like these. And in, in that case, uh, you know, setting up an operation there it, it will mean physical risk, will mean, you know, bureaucratic risk, but, you know, it'll also mean task, uh, taxes, it'll mean, you know, labor laws, it'll mean a whole lot of different sort of risks. And the, the Mexican government, long time ago, established with what are called shelter laws, where it, it allows a foreign company to actually come into Mexico and work in Mexico without actually having a tax address there. So, you know, as long as they work through a partner, so that's that's sort of what we do, right? We partner with these companies in order for them not to have to have a tax ID number. So we're liable for all the taxes, you know, we take on liability for labor laws, we take on all sorts of liabilities for our partner, that way our partner can go, go in and sort of establish themselves and shield themselves or, you know, keep risk, legal risks and tax risks and, and others at, ar at arm's length. So, you know, there's compliance, there's, there's personnel, there's bureaucracy, there's taxes, with the right partner, mm. right? Whether it's a service provider partner, or in our case, you know, we partner with these service providers in order to ensure all this. That that's that's really the way to go. If if companies try to set up their own firms in country, they're, they're just going to go through a huge, huge mess, and that that's probably the biggest no-no, right? But at least the the soft landing services and the ability to support them from the get-go just diminishes risks and, and and raises the ability to start working very quickly. Another important consideration is that uh, how the government transmit the feeling of security to establishing new businesses in, in the countries. The, the list of countries that uh, may be rising in the next years. Uh, we have a very good example in Costa Rica that they, uh, maybe 12, 15 years ago, they invest in all this system in combination with the, with the government. So there's a, a, a foreign investment agency that is not part of the government. It's like a one-stop shop. You know, you, you arrive to Costa Rica, you get in contact with these um, offices, CINDE, and they provide you with all this uh, information uh, that is very important for the, for the uh, company. So that, that is a good example. Now El Salvador has copied the same model, 
So I'm pretty sure that they, when they put it in, 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 in practice, it will be more easy to get there and, and start doing business. In, in to me, it's very interesting talking about this security and this image, the job that Colombia has done. Mm. If you mention Colombia to someone that is not familiar, the, the, the image of the Colombia from the 80s comes. So, so that work, and, and now if you say Honduras, you get, you get those images. So I, I think most of the Latin American countries are, are looking at these success stories, and, and they are developing these programs to uh, develop a positive PR uh, for the security of, the, of, the, of their countries. And they are directly engaging the uh, security firms in the US that provide these services and these ratings to the large US corporations. So, uh, uh, because at the end of the day, and it was mentioned two or three times during the day today, more business in Latin America means more safety uh, uh, for the whole region, including the U.S. Right. Think about a, a country's image and a country's positioning. You know, Colombia, we, when, when someone said Colombia 20 years ago, we used to think Pablo Escobar, right? And now it's Juan Valdez. I mean, it's, 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 it's incredible. <laughs> so it, it's certainly the government's job, but it's, it's private industry's job as well, right? The Mexican government or the Colombian government can't engage as many companies, right? They, they're basically demand for fillers. They, they need companies to come to them. But it's, it's I think, important uh, or pertinent in order for us to go out and sort of promote the, the, that the image that most people have of Latin America is wrong. It's important for companies to partner with government, partner with these, and, you know, and, and begin to do this. For you guys, are you seeing more interest from U.S.? firms, for example, in the region and taking advantage of it? Probably 10 years ago, there was no thought of outsourcing work in Latin America. It was all going to the Philippines. Uh, and I'm aware of uh, a number uh, of colleagues and, and other organizations uh, that have made uh, choices uh, to, uh, to Latin America, both American companies and Canadian. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it, it, it's definitely something that has caught people's attention. Uh, and, and the rates are comparable to mm. what you, you see in the Philippines and, and in India uh, with uh, a heck of a lot uh, more conveniences. Uh, European and Indian companies, for example, finding interest in a place like Mexico. Ultimately, there's a lot of interest in nearshoring, right? And as more um, IT or and other service providers who aren't nearshore, right, they have to make the strategic realization that they're either going to lose business over the long term because of you know, proximity. Indian firms, European firms, are now looking at coming into Latin America in order to provide services from Latin America. Right? So 10 years ago, no one would have thunk right, or, that, uh, that you would have Indians coming, coming into Mexico in order to use Mexican engineers to provide mm -hmm. services to their Indian customers. Right? I mean, it's a mouthful. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, so you now have Europeans, you know, Russian, Belarus, uh, Belarus companies, French companies, Indian companies. It's, it's getting super interesting. Nice.